In this video, you'll hear tales of mysterious voices ordering people outside, doppelgangers mimicking loved ones, and sinister secrets uncovered through the dark web. From a girlfriend stalked by her boyfriend's evil twin to a boy who discovered his parents' horrifying murders, these three terrifying true horror stories are guaranteed to keep you up at night. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the most horrifying and shocking stories, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload twice a week. So please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. The day had been utterly ordinary. I'd gone to classes, grabbed a quick dinner with friends, and was now curled up on the couch scanning social media. But this was no ordinary evening. Tonight was date night, and I was giddy with excitement for Alex's arrival. My phone shattered the silence, lighting up with his name. Just got off work. Be there soon, babe. His warm, familiar voice instantly set me at ease. I quickly tidied up, freshened my lip gloss and fluffed my hair, then settled in at the kitchen table to scroll through my phone as I awaited his arrival. Alex had a key, but we'd established a routine. I'd wait in the kitchen, then greet him with a hug and a kiss when he came in through the back porch. The sound of tires crunching on gravel sent butterflies swirling in my stomach. My phone buzzed. Here. I smiled, expecting the back door to open. But instead, a faint voice drifted in from the pitch black porch. Baby, come outside. A chill crept down my spine. That wasn't Alex's voice. I peered out the window into the inky darkness but saw nothing. Unease swirled inside me. I called his cell phone, my hands trembling. It rang twice and went silent. I tried again and again, panic rising in my throat. The voice called out once more, angry, shouting my full name and commanding me outside. This was not my Alex. I cowered behind the curtains, texting him frantically. The thing knew I was there. It started pounding violently on the back door as I whimpered in fear. After what felt like an eternity, Alex finally answered, apologizing. His phone had been on silent. I urgently explained what was happening. The angry pounding continued. Alex's tires screeched as he raced down my long, isolated driveway. I gathered my courage and pulled back the curtain. Nothing but empty blackness on the porch. Moments later, keys rattled in the front door, and Alex charged in, slamming it closed behind him. The voice and pounding stopped instantly. We clutched each other tightly, hearts pounding, bodies trembling. Peering outside, all I saw was a deer bounding on its hind legs into the woods, front hooves hitting the ground as it disappeared between the trees. We barely slept that night, holding each other close until sunrise. In the morning, we resolved to start looking for a place together closer to the city. I wanted to escape the isolation of my rural home that had brought such terror. In the weeks that followed, we spent every night together, the memory of that angry voice always lurking in the corner of my mind. Alex was patient and gentle, comforting me when nightmares would wake me in a cold sweat. In time, staying with him each night helped heal my frayed nerves. We did move closer to the city that summer, to a little house on a friendly, lively street. I finally began feeling at home there, but part of me wonders if I'll ever truly escape the horror of that night. The powerless isolation, the pleading voice, the violent pounding in the dark. Marco and I have been living together for over two years now. We never had any issues with our arrangement. We work together to keep the apartment clean, rent gets paid on time and in full every month, and I believe we've actually evolved into being friends over time. Therefore, these problems we've been having really threw me off guard. It started when Marco staunchly refused to leave his room. I wasn't exactly worried at first. Our area has recently been hit by an extreme heat wave, and since we don't have an AC, I figured Marco locked himself in with a bunch of electric fans. When I went to knock on his door, I could hear them whirring on the other side. It weirded me out that he didn't answer immediately, though. After waiting a couple seconds, I chalked it up to him being asleep. 
but just as I was about to turn and leave, he called out to me. Jen? I breathed a sigh of relief. At least he wasn't dead. Yeah, it's me. Just wanted to ask if everything's all right. Sure, I'm, uh, great. His voice gave me pause. It sounded unusual, unway like her him. It was garbled and had an almost hissy quality to it. Are you going to the store? Yeah, I answered, trying not to make my discomfort known. Need anything? Can you get me a six-pack and a bag of ice, maybe? I told him I would, and upon my return, I found a twenty lying on the floor by his doorframe. Keep the change, Marco shouted. I placed the items he'd ordered where his money had been and left, hoping things would be back to normal the following day. Perhaps Marco had caught a heat stroke working outside, and that's all there was to it. Temperatures aren't normally that high where we live, so nobody's used to this kind of weather. The day after was a Sunday, and I made breakfast for the two of us like I did every week. Unlike every week, however, Marco wasn't waiting in the kitchen for it to be finished. At first, I hollered for him to come out and eat with me, but when he didn't answer, I carried a plate of pancakes over to his room. I knocked, then asked into the silence whether he wanted any. I received no response, so I set aside the plate and banged both fists against his door. Still nothing. Both irritated and uneasy, I tried the door handle. My roommate and I are very respectful of each other's privacy, and I would never do so if it wasn't a pressing matter. It didn't amount to anything either way. Marco had locked himself in. He was definitely there, though. I heard his chair squeak. Are you okay? I asked. I can call a doctor or... I trailed off when I saw a note being slid through the crack beneath the door right at my feet. I bent down to pick it up. It was in Marco's handwriting, but decidedly messy, like he'd been in a great hurry and practically spewed ink onto the paper. Hey Jen, I'm fine, but my throat hurts so I can't talk. I'm sorry, but I'm not coming out. I don't want to pass it on to you. I don't need a doctor. I bet I'll be fine in a couple days. Don't worry, okay? I frowned at the note, but took the news in stride. What else could I do? I told Marco I'd leave the pancakes outside for him, and not long after I'd returned to the living room, I could hear him dragging the plate inside. I found myself rather missing Marco's presence around the apartment. Three days went by without me catching so much as a glimpse of him. I'd have to walk past his door to get to the bathroom, and I would hear him playing the weather report on his little TV inside every time. On the fourth morning, I found another note, this time on the fridge. Hey Jen, I'm going out to see my mom, be back in a week. What the hell? First he's sick, now he's going on a trip. I was beyond confused. I tried to call him, but he didn't pick up. That wasn't really a surprise. Marco is one of those people who don't ever really use their cell phone. Most of the time, he doesn't even have it on him. Nevertheless, it only added to my growing concerns. Another two days passed, and I didn't hear a thing from my roommate. I tried once more to call him when I got off work, just in case. It was already nighttime, and Marco normally went to bed quite early, so I didn't really expect him to pick up. And he didn't. Instead, I heard a familiar ringtone coming from his room. It only lasted a few seconds before stopping abruptly, like it had been turned off in a hurry. My stomach sank when the realization set in. Why in the world would he lie to me? This didn't make any sense. The whole situation had the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But despite this, I began heading towards Marco's room. His door looked eerie in the dim lamplight of the hallway. I inched closer, hand outstretched to jiggle the handle. Locked. Of course. Marco. I tried, pressing my ear up to the wood. What's going on? No answer. I could hear a squeaking noise coming from inside, like a chair being moved. What the hell, man? I said, stifling the tremor in my voice. You're clearly in there. I don't understand. That's when I had an idea. There were spare keys to all the rooms in a drawer in the living room cabinet. Neither of us had ever used them before, but there they were. Marco, if you're not going to talk to me, then I'm coming in. 
I declared with all the determination I could muster. He didn't respond. I'm serious. I'm getting the spare, and then I'm coming in. Silence. I bit my lip, turned on my heel, and headed for the living room. My heart was thundering in my chest when I returned with the key. I crammed it into the hole with shaking fingers, turning it once, then twice. Click. I swallowed, stealing myself before I pushed down the handle and nudged the door open. The motion was accompanied by a drawn-out creaking noise that reminded me I should oil the hinges sometime. With my pulse thrumming in my ears, I entered the darkness beyond the threshold. I couldn't see anything except the limited areas that were illuminated by the ceiling lamp shining in from the hallway. In vain, I groped around for the light switch, then I decided to give up and just proceed. Something stopped me from going back and grabbing a flashlight. I simply had a feeling I shouldn't turn my back on that room. Both arms outstretched, I ventured further inside, feeling around for Marco's desk. Soon enough, my palms met with the smooth hardwood and I braced myself against it almost desperately. Marco? I asked, an intangible fear compelling me to whisper. My hands started roaming the surface in front of me. I could feel his laptop powered off and shut, his mouse pad and a set of pens and pencils. Then I moved on to the chair. I flinched when I made contact with something dry and soft hanging over it. At first, I thought it was a t-shirt, but the fabric felt almost like extremely thin baking paper. I continued to stroke it, and as my hand went down what was presumably the neck hole, I found that it was warm and damp. Disgusted, I withdrew from the surely sweat-soaked piece of clothing. Remembering Marco's small desk lamp, I mentally palmed my face for not looking for it sooner. It didn't take me long to locate the switch. As the small light came on, its beam fell onto what I'd thought to be a shirt, causing me to recoil in shock. It was skin. There was an entire skin suit slung over the back of the chair. It was like a snake's shedding, except tan and pink and human-shaped, with two arms and two legs and a tear in the back from which its wearer must have emerged. The remnants of the face dangled from the ragged neck scrap, and it looked like the dried remains of one of those cosmetic geel masks. I stared at it for a moment, my eyes bulging and my heart in my throat before I started to violently gag. I clung to the edge of the desk for dear life, trying to keep my thoughts in order. And that's when I heard it. A garbled, distorted hiss coming from right above me. I whipped my head up just in time to catch a glimpse of a figure scuttling across the ceiling and disappearing into the hallway at an inhuman speed. My mind raced, but before I could think of anything better to do, my feet were already carrying me out the door. I burst into the living room, my face burning as panic spread throughout my body. Inwardly, I was yelling at myself to get out, to leave this place while I still could. Despite this, I followed the sound of dishes rattling into the kitchen. I hastily flicked on the lights and started looking around for the source of the noise. My stomach was churning and beads of cold sweat ran down my face. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew that whatever had been hiding in the shadows could be none other than Marco. Marco, who was somehow able to walk on the ceiling, who had shed his skin and deposited it on the chair at his desk. Marco, who I'd been living with for two years, who had always been kind and friendly and open, who never argued when it was his turn to clean or take the trash out. Marco, who most definitely wasn't human. Marco. Marco was staring at me. I could feel his gaze burning holes into my side. I turned to the right, slowly raising my eyes to the kitchen cupboard. Cowering on top of it, not unlike a wild cat, was my roommate. He had pressed himself against the wall, flattening himself to the cabinet on all fours like a master contortionist. His entire body was of a dripping, aggravated scarlet. His face was bright red, his eyes bulging out of his head. It looked as though the lids were missing. Marco's lips had thinned and receded so his gums were on display. I'd never realized how large his teeth were. Dampened brown curls clung to his neck and temples. Rooted to the spot, all I could do was stare at this thing that my friend had turned into. He, it, stared back, 
that same hissing sound emanating from somewhere deep in its throat. Slowly but surely, it loosened from its rigidity and began crawling towards me, sticking to the ceiling like an enormous anthropomorphic gecko. The fluids coating Marco's pink body dripped onto the floor in front of me. I must have forgotten how to breathe altogether. My tongue was bone dry, like a dead leaf lying limp inside my mouth. Marco, I muttered. Marco, this is you, right? A rumble rolled from his chest, something akin to a growl. I raised both my hands, taking a step back as he advanced. You're okay, I swear, I stammered. I'm not gonna tell. Whatever this is, I promise I'm not gonna tell. He stopped and cocked his head, neck cracking. His mouth fell open and his tongue dropped out. It was twice as long as humanly possible. I stifled a shudder, keeping my hands up and forcing myself to assume a soothing expression. Everything's okay. Stop growling. You know me. We live together. I make you breakfast on Sundays, and it's your turn to take the trash out tomorrow. Marco closed his mouth. He crept over to the left wall and began descending, movements fast and spider-like. Once more, standing on two feet, he started walking towards me, step by step, the soles of his skin-stripped feet creating a wet slapping sound on the smooth, clean floor. I dropped my arms, focusing on keeping my breathing steady until he finally came to a stop in front of me. You're okay, I repeated. You're all right. Can you still hear me? Do you understand what I'm saying? A nod. Then, he opened his mouth, forcibly shaping the growls and hissing noises into distorted, almost intelligible words. My kind is sensitive to heat. I first met my best friend, Alex, a little bit after I got into high school. My parents had moved us to a new town, and I had no friends. It was lonely at first, but I got used to it. We moved because they were paranoid after many murders occurred in our town. I thought this was weird, moving across the country over that, but I let it go. The reason Alex and I became friends so quickly was because we both had a shared interest in the internet and everything it had to offer. I was a gaming addict and a tier 3 Pokemane subscriber while he was more of a coder and developer. Two years later, we were still best friends, but now we are much older and smarter. Alex had discovered the dark web and he was obsessed with it. He pretty much spent every hour of the day on it searching through anything you could imagine. There was nothing wrong with this, but one search he made was the biggest mistake of his entire life. I remember waking up to dozens of text messages from him one morning. This wasn't normal. Alex wasn't a very social person, and it was very hard to get words out of him. I opened my phone to see what he had messaged me. Dude, Jack, you have to come over right now. This is important. Jack, please wake up. This is urgent. Where are you? These were only some of the messages, but the rest were very similar, with them all being urgent and that I needed to go to his house immediately. My parents were both at work still, so I went over to Alex's house. When I arrived, there were four cop cars parked in front of his house, and there were dozens of people and news vans standing out front. I made my way through the crowd, and Alex's mother told the police to let me inside. I could see tears rolling down her cheeks as she opened the door. What's going on, Mrs. Gonzalez? I asked. Alex missing she said as she started crying. My heart sank. How could this happen? He had just texted me earlier that morning. That was when it hit me. What if he was trying to warn me? What if his text messages were related to his disappearance? Still in shock, I walked up to one of the detectives in the kitchen. Is Alex going to be okay? I asked. Of course he is. He's going to be just fine. We're going to find him very soon. One of the detectives responded. Something about that response was off. It was like I knew he was wrong. Deep down, I had this slight feeling that I wasn't going to see him ever again. I remembered the text messages, however, and pulled out my phone to show it to the detective. He texted me this morning. What if this has something to do with him going missing? I said swiftly. As he began reading them, his expression quickly changed. It was like it got worse. 
He told me they needed to keep my phone for now to investigate the text messages and said they would give it back to me later. I stayed around the house for a while, not just because I missed Alex, but because I wanted to comfort his parents. They cared about me a lot, and it hurt to see them like that. His mother couldn't stop crying. Eventually, however, I went into Alex's room to see if I could find anything that might give a clue about why he went missing. I searched through everything, but I found nothing. But then I noticed something. Alex's computer was on, but his monitor was turned off. I looked for the button to turn it on and hit it. As the screen lit up, my heart sank. He was on the dark web. Obviously, this was normal, but for some reason, he had dozens of different tabs opened. I knew this part wasn't normal, so I closed the door and locked it and began going through them. At first, it was all pretty usual for him, but then things started to get weird. He had a tab open that was an article about a murder that had happened several years ago. The article said that it was a woman who was found dead in her apartment. Her body was mutilated, cut up, and covered in acid. I nearly threw up reading it and seeing the horrifying pictures of the crime scene. Not wanting to see any of it anymore, I switched the tab just to reveal another article about another murder. Confused, I quickly went through the rest of the tabs he had open, and they were all the same thing. They all were about some type of murder or crime. The one that stuck out the most to me, however, was one about a murder that had happened two years ago. At first it seemed pretty normal, but as I read further, I realized what it was. It was about the murder of our neighbor that prompted us to move away. Confusion quickly swept over me. How did Alex know about this? I never told him about it, because to me, it wasn't that important. I figured it must have just been a strange coincidence, but then I saw the last search he had made on his computer. It was my last name. Horrified and confused, I quickly stumbled out of his room and back to the living room. Is everything all right? Alex's mother said, sniffing away her tears. Yeah, I just need to go home for dinner. I responded. On the way home, so many questions and thoughts filled my mind. Why was he searching up my last name? Did he think that I had something to do with this? That must have been why he was texting me so frantically that morning. If only I could just explain to him that I didn't do anything wrong, but I couldn't. He was still missing, and I had to find out why. When I got home, I raced to my room and slammed the bedroom door shut and got on my computer. I loaded up my Tor browser and turned my VPN on. I knew what I had to do. I began typing in the letters of my last name, becoming more nervous after every letter. When I finally hit enter, nothing happened. It was just a blank screen. Confused, I refreshed the page, but once again, there was nothing. But why did Alex search this if there was nothing? I thought to myself, there must be something out there. I was getting ready to close the tab, thinking I had run into a dead end when suddenly the page started to load. It took several minutes, but finally it loaded to reveal hundreds of videos. Immediately, I knew what they were. They were murders, but why did they show up when you searched my last name? I considered just stopping right there and turning back, knowing the horrifying things I would see if I continued on, but I couldn't. I knew this had to be why Alex went missing, so I clicked on the first video. As it started playing, I saw what looked like a woman strapped to a chair in some sort of basement or something. I quickly recognized who it was. It was our neighbor from two years ago, I could tell because she had the same heart-shaped tattoo on her neck. She sat there for a minute, struggling, panicking, and screaming for someone to help. However, suddenly, two figures walked into frame. At first, I couldn't tell who they were, but as they turned around to face the camera, my heart sank. It was my parents. My father was holding a knife while my mother was holding a small scalpel. They paused for a moment before they started what was the most horrifying five minutes of my entire life. I watched as they cut her into pieces and listened as she begged for mercy, screaming the whole time. Blood filled the room as she took her last breath. When the video ended, it quickly went to another, revealing the exact same room and chair I had seen before. I was traumatized by what I had already seen, and I knew I couldn't watch any more of it. My parents were murderers, and I now knew the real reason we moved away two years ago. 
I knew there was something off about that, but I just never could have imagined that this was the horrifying secret that they had been hiding from me. This whole time, I thought Alex was trying to accuse me of being responsible for these murders, but I was so wrong. He was trying to warn me. I scanned through more of the videos, each in the exact same room. I was just about finished, ready to go to the police so that I could tell them about what I had just seen when I noticed something. There was a new video uploaded today on the website. I quickly clicked on it and pressed play to reveal what looked like a man this time, strapped to the chair. He had a sack over his face, and I couldn't tell who it was. Once again, however, I saw my parents walk into the frame. My father walked up to the man and pulled the sack off his head. At first, I couldn't tell who it was, but then I realized who I was looking at. It was Alex. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed these three terrifying true horror stories. If you did, please hit the like button and share this video with your friends. And if you have any scary stories of your own, feel free to send them to me at my email address or in the comments section below. I might feature them in a future video. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss any of my upcoming videos. You can also follow me on social media in the description below. Thank you for your support, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, stay safe and stay scared.